one of the most important things I learned growing up is that people can come to embrace the unfamiliar and even unusual if you invite them in with a friendly welcome. This lesson came from my father, who grew up on the streets of Bangkok and came to the United States in the 90s, determined to build a restaurant empire. His skill in the kitchen and infectious enthusiasm at the tables helped introduce these foreign and exotic flavors to the citizens of the greater Atlanta area. I would sometimes help out at the restaurants, making Thai iced tea in the kitchen, or folding napkins, or bringing people to their table. My dad loved growing the business, but what he loved most was connecting people to Thai culture and giving them new and wonderful experiences. My mother was considered the bright one in her big Indonesian family. A reader and a thinker, she imbued me with a sense of curiosity. After school, I would spend hours with a microscope and sketchbook she had given me, drawing things that I found in our backyard, like a pair of butterfly wings or a shell from the peanut plant we had grown together. Looking back, I realized she basically tricked me into learning science <laughs> by framing it as playtime. In high school, I worked in a cancer lab, learning how cells replicate and die. I was accepted to Columbia, where I majored in neuroscience. And after graduation, I joined a research team studying cognitive decline in older adults. And that's when it happened. The question that changed everything for me. I was walking one of our patients out of the research suite. He had just completed a battery of tests when he turned to me and asked, "How did I help science?" The first thing I said was something like, "Well, if you want to read our paper, I can send it to you when we're done in a couple of months, and have finished all of our statistical analyses." I quickly realized that I hadn't answered his question at all. I then tried to explain the study in a more general way, but all I remember is the blank look on his face after I had finished. How could I make an impact on the world with science when I couldn't even answer a simple question about our research? I wasn't alone struggling with this. Nearly every group at the research center was struggling to share their work with a broader audience. Frustrated by our failure to communicate, I began hunting for tools and strategies to tackle this problem head-on. I found my answer in an unlikely place: design. In particular, communication design, which I studied in grad school. There, I learned to harness the power of design to convey ideas, evoke emotions, and move people to action. Since then, I've led design work at agencies, startups, and now a Fortune 100 company. Using my skills as a designer, I've launched several initiatives that have allowed me to introduce the wonder and humanity of science to the world, just like my dad introduced Thai food. To our neighbors, the first initiative is about heroes. We all need heroes. Growing up, mine was Rita Levi Montalcini. A science teacher had asked us to write a report on an important scientist, and I decided to dig past the better-known men of science and look for a woman. After a trip to the library, I found Rita, who discovered nerve growth factor in the 1940s. Mussolini had barred Jews from working in academic settings. Sarita set up a makeshift laboratory in her bedroom and made her initial discovery there. Years later, I was retelling Rita's story one day and tried to name some of the other female scientists who had shaped their fields in significant ways, but I drew a blank. The only other woman that came to mind was the legendary scientist Marie Curie. This experience led me to create Beyond Curie. A series of illustrations and stories that highlights the rich history of women kicking ass in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Women like Maria Mirzakhani and Mary Golda Ross, who deserve to be just as celebrated as Marie Curie. The project was funded by a Kickstarter campaign, which attracted hundreds of backers, parents, teachers, scientists, and programmers who wanted the women in their lives to be inspired by that same legacy. In partnership with the March for Science organizers, I released a special series of free posters that anyone could download and print for a rally or protest. A couple of months later, I traveled down to Washington D.C., 
along with thousands of others, and we stood huddled under our umbrellas on that wet, dreary day, taking to the streets of the nation's capital to march for science. And that's when I saw her, a woman carrying a huge bedazzled Beyond Curie poster of Rosalind Franklin, <laughs> the scientist who had made crucial contributions to the understanding of DNA's double helix structure. It was the same poster that I'd brought with me to the march. She told me that she was getting her PhD and had flown into DC from South Dakota. For her, the poster was an irrefutable statement that science belongs just as much to women as it does to men. The next initiative I'd like to share with you is about play, a subject that some have called the highest form of research. Most of us have fond memories of going to the science museum as a kid. Maybe you're now introducing your own children to the joys of dinosaur skeletons, optical illusions, and modular robots. And my guess is that the kids aren't the only ones enjoying themselves. The feeling of wonder is universal. So couldn't grown-ups get in on the fun? To find out, I paired five neuroscientists with five designers to participate in an experiment around play. Each team was asked to co-create an interactive exhibit that was scientifically rigorous and visually compelling. They had 13 weeks to develop their creations for a public showing, a pop-up science museum designed for adults. I named the project The Leading Strand after a key element in the DNA replication process. Some of the collaborations got off to a bumpy start. I remember Sam, a neuroscientist at the Bujaki lab at NYU, writing me increasingly frustrated emails about his partner, a designer named Brian, who couldn't seem to find the right angle for their project. I was worried. Was this whole thing a terrible idea? Maybe designers and scientists were too different and couldn't collaborate as peers. In desperation, I suggested that Brian visit Sam in the lab and spend some more time just exploring the space, the people, and the tools to immerse himself in Sam's world. I also helped Sam understand that designers often put their ideas through an extended incubation period before bringing them to life. Eventually, they were able to find common ground. Sam realized that a lot of his initial emails and sketches were difficult for someone without a neuroscience background to understand. And Brian similarly realized that it'd be helpful for him to share his ideas earlier on, even if they weren't fully formed. At some point during the visit, the two found themselves in front of a whiteboard, drawing and discussing. And that's when the magic started to happen. Together, Sam and Brian built a continuously learning song that listens to, remembers, and interprets inputs from its environment, acting as a musical metaphor for how memory might work in the human brain. Their piece, along with four others, was showcased later that summer at a packed three-day exhibit in New York. It was a celebration of play and a reminder that play is a central part of human life. Opportunities to play can usher people into a new world. Instead of sending someone a dry academic paper, we can create tangible and immersive experiences that help them touch, feel, and interact with science. My latest initiative is about creating a community of curious girls who own their individuality and it starts with the story of a young woman named Valeria. Valeria grew up in Honduras. She did well in her science classes and dreamed of a career in medicine. The world around her did not always agree. While being treated for a broken ankle, a physician told her that being a doctor was for boys, not girls. She was the first in her family to attend college, enrolling at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Journalism, her initial major left her feeling unfulfilled, and she began volunteering at the emergency room. Valeria discovered that her childhood doctor was wrong. She was absolutely cut out for a career in medicine. She looked around for student groups on campus, focused on women in science. She couldn't find any, so she started one to do just that. Now a senior, Valeria has gathered a sisterhood of future doctors, scientists, and engineers who support and inspire one another in pursuing their careers in STEM. Every girl should have that same opportunity. I 
I've been working to create a fashion line and community for women and girls just like Valeria to express their love for science and find their tribe. We produce shirts, dresses, and accessories centered around each of the 118 atomic elements that make up our world. <laughs> Hydrogen, the lightest and most prolific element in the universe. Carbon, the quintessential connector and linchpin of life. Sodium, the silvery white metal that's a key player in our body's ability to fire nerve impulses. Every element, like the women who wear them, plays an important role in shaping our world. Beyond the clothing, we've developed educational materials and programming that allows our members to learn more about these elements, engage with real scientists, and connect with each other, helping them to take their passion further. Sometimes, when I helped out at my dad's restaurants, our guests would ask me for dish recommendations. I would always suggest Pad Thai. <laughs> its friendly mix of flavors and lack of heat make it the perfect gateway dish to the more adventurous Thai curries and ceviches. Just like Pad Thai opens the door to new aromas and delights, my projects are working to change the way people engage with science. The three themes that have emerged from this work are heroes, play, and community by putting a core aspect of the human experience into each of these projects, I've been able to give people a way to connect with science that isn't cold and abstract, but instead personal, responsive, and uplifting. I'm not alone in this effort. The work being done across the STEM fields today is full of promise, but also peril. There are brilliant people tackling our most urgent scientific issues from advancing the ethics of AI and biological interventions to increasing funding for basic research, to removing barriers for women and people of color. Using design, my projects are working to help this effort by connecting people to science through engaging and relatable experiences. Design is about understanding human needs and solving tough problems within bounded constraints. Science is about using a rigorous and empirical process to understand the laws that govern our universe. And when they work together, they can address some of the most pressing challenges of our time. Thank you.